Hello and welcome to another episode of Dawncast Vodcast, where we shine the light on diversity of stories and talent that make Australia's multicultural society the success it is today. I'm really thrilled and excited to have Tan Chung, aka Mr. Fruit Nerd, a recent contestant on uh, Channel 7's Plate of Origin, joining us on Dawncast. So, welcome, Tan. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm glad you're wearing one of your fruit shirt. <laughs> That's right. I'm wearing the mangosteen top because, you know, uh, mangosteen is the queen of fruit and is my favourite fruit. Oh, it's a queen of fruit. So we will go into uh, into uh, Tan's uh, fruit shirt in a minute. Um, but so, but while Tan and your co-presenter Duncan Liu did not make it to the finals, with but you did manage to really create some amazing dishes, uh, Vietnamese dishes, and showcase that to the Australian audience. Is that right? That's it. Yeah, we made it to the grand final, but we oh, weren't able final. to win. But okay. um, yes, look, we were so happy that we could get so far and and really champion Vietnamese cuisine, but also um, cook dishes that aren't mainstream, that what you would usually consider Vietnamese food, something that a Vietnamese family would eat but not so so much something that you know a regular australian would go out to eat as vietnamese food so we really wanted to shine the light on food that uh, is probably considered more uh homely and less uh i guess um authentic it's quite authentic vietnamese yeah. dishes and, and including which i know that we couldn't talk about it when you were preparing for the grand final but the bitter melon dish that's right the gun which is, <laughs> as you know, very culturally significant to Vietnamese people. It means to pass through hardship. We eat it during just before uh, the Lunar New Year. And, um, you know, it's a really, it's a dish very close to my heart. It's my mom's favorite dish. And it's a very polarizing dish. You know, bitter flavors isn't something that uh, I think the Caucasian palate is used to. No. And, um, you know, we all love coffee and coffee is very bitter. And so I really wanted to bring this savory, bitter flavor um into the spotlight. Yeah. So for the audience who don't know what a bitter melon is, we probably will we'll get some of those photos and show later when we cut a clip together. But is is a green kind of look like a ripply skin, but it's mm. so bitter. Um, so That's how, right. how, how did you um, – and, and it's an acquired taste, isn't it? Like to have to taste that bitterness. But the way we cook it and tell us how you cooked and how you made that dish and how, how was that – received on on the show yeah so uh, bitter melon is i believe a quite a difficult um bitter melon is quite a difficult uh melon or vegetable you if you could call it it's actually a fruit but um you know it's, a, it's quite a difficult um piece of produce to get well balanced so um, we had pork jowl to add some fattiness we had some pork neck to add some meatiness um there was a soy sauce and chili, so we had acid, and then we had uh, saltiness. Um, so we've got bitterness, saltiness, um, spiciness, meatiness, and all that had to balance. But for us, um, I had been practicing this dish for a while, and um, I knew that potentially the judges might consider it too bitter. So what I did was I blanched it in a bit of salty ice water to begin with, just for about between 10 minutes to 15 minutes, um, any longer, and you'd strip too much of that bitter flavor out. And I still wanted to keep that uh, strong bitter notes. But when you eat food, there's what I consider a initial palate. So uh, sugar, you get that sugar hit, and then it goes away. And then you get depth. So the depth is the, I, I would consider the deep flavor of the bitterness. And I wanted that to come through, but I didn't want that sharp bitter flavor to hit when they first um, bit into the um, bitter melon soup. So um, that's why I, I uh, blanched it and then I just mellowed out that bitter flavour but still kept it true to its roots. And how was it received? Um, 10 out of 10 out of 10. It was a perfect oh, score. Yes. Kept us in the grand final. <laughs> wow, that's the first time a bitter melon, uh, you know, a Vietnamese dish kind of a bitter one as well, uh, you know, being actually wow, re well received from the sound of it. Yeah, um, we, we were so pleased. You know, I didn't want to cook the dish any earlier. I thought it was too polarizing and too risky. Um, you know, we clearly had to strategize in terms of what we were going to cook in each round. Um, but when it got to the grand final, I knew that this was it. This was our last opportunity. This was the statement that I wanted to make personally as a fruiterer and as a Vietnamese uh, descendant um, to showcase how 
proud I am to be Vietnamese and to eat, you know, homely Vietnamese dishes, not just your pho and spring rolls and bun mi. Yep. So I'm um, really glad we had the opportunity and really um, glad that we had the courage to um, cook this dish and that it was well received. So um, yeah, just so so pleased. Brave, a brave move. Um, but talking about uh, plate of origin, tell us about your origin. I mean, you are, as you said, Vietnamese heritage. Uh, ha- where you grew up and uh, your back, your your upbringing. Yeah, look, I've had a very blessed upbringing. Um, I grew up and was born and raised in Springvale, which is the you know the similar similar Cabra matter. Of That's New right, South the Wales, heart yeah. of Vietnamese uh, Australian population in Melbourne. Correct. Yes. So, you know, um, pretty much everyone at school was uh, of some Vietnamese descent. You know, my parents came over to Australia like many uh, Vietnamese migrants with nothing. And, um, you know, um, when we were young, we had there was quite a bit of hardship. And I guess, you know, our family's gone through a bit of everything because um, by the time it went, we got to high school, you know, my family started to generate some wealth. And I was one of the more privileged ones of the children in my family to actually go to private school. And I actually went to Melbourne Grammar, which you know, you probably couldn't get any more polarizingly different in terms of educations from um, St. Joseph's Springvale to Milton Grammar. So, um, you know, I've had a very privileged upbringing of, um, you know, uh, a bit of hardship and a bit of privilege. And and I feel as though, you know, I've really stepped into many different worlds throughout my life. And um, I just really wanted to showcase and, and to, you know, be a shining light that, you know, um, doesn't matter where you come from, um, you know, we've, we're, we live in a very blessed country where many, you know, we've got so much opportunity, so much safety, and that um, you can make your dreams come true. Absolutely. I mean, Australia's, uh, I think, like I said at the start, um, I want to shine the light on the diversity of stories and talent that makes uh, Australia, you know, multicultural society, the success that it is today. And I, I don't think we, we credit enough to the contributions of migrants like your parents and now like yourself. Mm-hmm. So, um, so thank you for that. So the journey then from uh, being uh, brought up in, a, as you said, a privileged background in, you know, Melbourne grammar, private, uh, private school, to becoming a fruit nerd. Uh, the fruit journey, how did you become from, you know, you couldn't go out there to kind of doing a, an MBA or some financial or law, or whatever, but you went into, into I, I hear, you know, fruit and, and vegetable is something that, that you love very much. Yeah, you know, it's 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 funny how life works. You know, I think as um, an, an Asian um, in Australia, you know, we're very much stereotyped to being good at maths and you know, being a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer. Both That's my right. brothers are lawyers, by the way. All right, so, so you <laughs> best stereotype around. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're, most of us do accounting. I did accounting. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny how we live this dream of the, the corporate life. And it's what our parents want for us because, you know, they've gone through this blue collar, very hard working lifestyle. And they want something more easier for their children, right? The Absolutely. best for their children. And um, I think it's it's funny how um, as, as a younger Tan, I went through school wanting to be these professions. But then as I you know, I left, uh, you know, I finished my degree in commerce and arts. I majored in finance. I, I worked in accounting for a year and then I uh, was fortunate enough to be a Coles graduate. Um, and then, you know, you, you start to get in that rhythm of the corporate life, trying to climb the corporate ladder. And you, you start to think about, I mean, very philosophical. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? And, you know, <laughs> hey, should I be doing this forever? <laughs> we all do that. I I, I, I right. like to play that all the time. So don't worry. <laughs> So, you know, I guess throughout that quarter life crisis or when I was working for Coles and I, you know, I, I, um, I contribute many of my uh, influences and successes to my time at Coles because I learned so much from the people around me and a lot about myself and what I wanted to do. But um, my parents were fruiterers. They've been fruiterers since, you know, the, er- the early 90s, 1991. Um, and I joined the fruit team and I realized that um, the Coles fruit team had, um, that they, they were so good at what they were doing, but they were trying to range lines for Chinese new year. Um, they were trying to do a promotional schedule and the understanding of the cultural, uh, uh, nuances of fruit and vegetables during Chinese New Year. We want to celebrate things that are of abundance, that is really sweet, that's red, that has a lot of leaves, that's floral, not 
put bok choy on special. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, <laughs> I know it's, it's an ironic story, but yeah. it's just, um, I realized that there was a, such a huge opportunity there for Asian migrants and the Asian community within Australia, even though we are a minority, um, you know, I think um, the supermarkets still have a long way to service that community, but they're doing everything they can. Um, and that's what led me to join the family business um, and be a fruiterer. And um, so you went. So you went from I, being a, a, in your career as a national fruit buyer at Coles Supermarket. So you, from that, you then moved back to the family business. Is that what happened? Yeah. So I joined the family business, and um, you know, at that time, um, you could say that the food. You could say that food culture in Australia was at its tipping point where. Um, you know, we're just, you know, there, there's been so many changes in the last 10 years, but, uh, but I feel as a, you know, MasterChef is one of those big things that people always attribute to the change of food culture for the next generation, because there would be, it's a very family friendly show. And there's many, many, um, you know, young Australians that will watch that show and be like, you know, I want to eat that, um, you know, what a bit of melon dish or, you know, I want to eat that, uh, beetle leaf, uh, yeah. you know, um, scallop dish that they made. And, and, um, it really uh, changed the dynamic of how food, the, how the food scene was seen in Australia, um, and you know representation like Poe. I remember the first time I saw yes, Poe come po. second, and yeah. I was like, "Wow!" Like I've never seen an Asian face on TV, and an, I've never seen an Asian face cook on TV <laughs> before. You know, I've, That's... you know, before then it was, you know, when I grew up, it was, it was like seeing Huey on TV, and yeah. I was excited. I was yeah. excited, right? <laughs> and I wanted to channel, to channel his energy, but. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we, we're really blessed that, you know, people of colour and, um, you know, uh, the, the whole cultural dynamic of media is changing because of people like yourself, you know, giving people a voice. Um, and, and also, I, I do believe that mainstream media is changing, albeit slowly. Um, it and, is still um, slowly. You know, for me, yeah, for me, being a fruiter and going back to my family's uh, business and, and roots, um, you know, it was, it's ironic because when I was a kid, I never wanted to wake up at like 2 a.m. in the morning and like do hard labor, move boxes and touch fruit, which I thought was, you know, gooey. Yeah. But um, it's funny how life go- comes around in a full circle because I'd gone through all that roots and I'd realized that, you know what, I could be a financier and look at numbers my whole life. But what's more grounding than actually seeing fruit every day, touching and feeling it and seeing the numbers after knowing that, you know, you sold 10,000 boxes, but every one of those boxes or pallets you've seen and you know where it's going. And I think that's the difference between me being a forecaster selling fruit and me being somebody who's just dealing with numbers and having no um, emotional connection to what I do. So, um, you know, and, you know, fruits and vegetables, who isn't excited about fruits and vegetables? It's... um, one of the most well, uh, kids, nourishing kids, kids are not excited about fruit and vegetables. So tell me what, what you know, <laughs> what, what got you, you know, I mean, obviously your, your family's business, but um, you know, why, why fruit and veggies? Yeah. You know, it, it, there's probably two key moments in my life where I realized that I was really passionate about this. Um, one of them, I got really upset and the other one, I was really shocked. So I'll, uh, I'll go with the shocked one first. Um, uh, we, I was sitting around um, at the dinner table. Um, we were at a restaurant with a couple of friends and, um, and, a, and a plate of food came along. And I could tell all my friends that, you know, the garlic had come from China, the asparagus came from Kiwi Rap, and the potatoes came from Tasmania. And all of my friends just looked at me in shock and, and in, in kind of... Uh, weird. Uh, <laughs> weird kind of... Uh, I don't even... I didn't even know. They, they were kind of confused to a certain extent. Like, how did I know this? And, and I'm... I was looking at them confused going, how do you not know this? And, uh, and when I realized that not just my friends, but everybody Mm -hmm. now does not know where their food comes from. Um, that kind of really got my mind ticking about why do we not know? Why are we so disconnected from food now? And, and why don't we care? Um, and that led me on this journey of understanding where my fruit and veg came from not just from, um, well, to, to give you a 30 second spiel, um, what most consumers see is what they see in the supermarket and what they see at a restaurant. Um, the other portion of that is what they cook and what they eat at home. But before the supermarket, before the fruit 
and veg greengrocer. There's this whole supply chain of trucks, of ripeners, of agents, before you even get to a farmer. And then when you get to the farmer, you got there's so many elements before you get to the seed, where it came from, is it genetically modified, what are they spraying on it? So there's this whole segment here which people aren't aware of, and they only see this tiny bit here, which is what you see on TV, which is what you see on MasterChef. And um, I wanted to shine the light on this huge part, which is unknown. Um, and that's that's what got me on this journey. Um, the other moment that kind of made me realize that this could be my, uh, you know, my passion and, and uh, I guess um, direction in life was uh, my friend asked me about apples and, and when is the season for apples? And I got really upset that he didn't know when the season <laughs> for apples was. And he actually said to me, please oh, don't when? get upset. I'm oh, just no. asking a question yeah, for my friend. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know when to see. Because we, <laughs> we seem to get apples all the time now. So there isn't a season anymore, is there? That's right, Di. There is a season. You know, so apples are picked between February, March, and April, depending on the variety, and they're stored for up to an entire year. Oh, my God. Store up for the entire year? Correct. Yeah, it's called modified atmosphere or controlled atmosphere. And what they do is they chill it down to half a degrees and they basically put it in this time chamber and they remove the oxygen out of the air where in the environment which we live in now and we're breathing there's about 20 percent and it's there's only one percent oxygen so it's basically breathing at 20 times the speed and it can last up to 12 to 13 months apples now so wow. um it's pretty crazy isn't it yeah but then, you could be eating a year old apple. Exactly. But then <laughs> is that healthy though? Like to have fruit um, stored for that long? It is. So I actually um, got in contact with the CSIRO that have done a lot of research. There's a bit of flavor loss after about nine months, but it is safe to eat and all the research has been done on it. But what it's done is it's, you know, um, what us being able to, humans have been able to commoditize fruit and vegetables. It's, uh, remove the sense of seasonality and um, and that romance of uh, a seasonal fruit is now lost in our modern day society. And that's the story that I want to tell. But, you know, I told my friend this and, and I got kind of upset that he didn't know. And I realized, and he said to me, why are you getting upset? And I didn't realize why I was getting upset myself, but then I realized I'm actually so passionate about it that it would actually get me upset. So those two moments were really key for me in realizing that um, this was a journey that I wanted to pursue and, um, and that's the journey that I've been on for the past six or seven years now. Yeah. So, and so what was, what's involved on that journey? Like obviously going back to, uh, you know, stepping out of the, the role at, at Coles and then going into your uh, parents' business, what were some of the first things that you got, um, you know, your hands on, uh, in, in your parents' business? You know, um, when I left Coles, I was still quite young. I was only 23. So, um, you know, I realized that there was so much more that I could learn from people within the industry. Um, but at the same time, I was pretty gung ho. So I really wanted to get out there. You know, I was traveling all of Asia. I was asking about the best packing sheds and gen genetically modified seeds in Thailand. And, you know, when I was in Adelaide in Virginia, I was looking at all the cucumbers and asking the chemical companies what they were using and, and how it was affecting the fruit and veg and whether it was good or bad. Um, and then, um, you know, I got to this point where I realized that uh, in terms of my knowledge of fruit and veg, it was it was to the level that I would consider um, uh, good enough to be a very knowledgeable fruiterer. And uh, there was one thing that I was really lacking, and that was how to cook. And uh, and that might sound stupid because you know most of us, uh, um, you know, you, you look at me now and I, I can actually cook. I'm quite capable. But hey, you're I would on say, Channel you know, Seven Plate of Origin. <laughs> of course, you can cook. <laughs> So what I did, what I did was I traveled this journey of from the farm to the market, and I'd understood a lot of the supermarket industry, how they do promotions, how they, you know, not manipulate, but how they try to uh, uh, push consumers in a certain way so that, you know, that, that they are, you know, that, that it's easy for them, more convenient, you know, um, it's not manipulative. It's just, um, you know, how, the way they do business. But for me, if I'm a fruiterer and I'm telling you, um, are you going to fry these potatoes or are you going to make it into a mash? I didn't realize the technicality in a potato, but for me, it's 
it's very different telling somebody something that you know and telling somebody something that you've done before. So if I was able to cook fries, if I was able to cook mash, then I had this personal connection to cooking. So as a fruiterer, I could tell you, well, you know, with these King Edwards, you can both mash them and fry them. They're better in a, um, if you fry them as a potato because it holds better structure, but it's still got good flavor when you mash it. And I've mashed it before with a bit of butter, a bit of olive oil and a bit of rosemary. It goes really well. So that personal connection, I realized that was what I really wanted in a fruiterer. So I was trying to be... Uh, devil's advocate to a certain extent and put myself in the shoes of a consumer. Mm. And so that led me on this journey of cooking all of these Asian produce, which I sell. Um, so I would consider myself in terms of an Asian fruiter, um, quite skilled and specialized. In terms of a general fruiter, I'm quite knowledgeable, but um, certainly as an Asian fruiter in Asian fruit and veg and herbs, um, that's really where where I excel and where I hope to, um, you know, educate the next generation um, and, and get people more excited, more engaged to to get into the kitchen, to go to their fruiter, to ask questions, to go go to a farm because most of, you know, the, ne- the, the younger generation haven't stepped foot on a farm before and, um, you Absolutely. know, I hope that changes. Well, I, I have stepped on a farm, just to let you know. <laughs> um, I went to a friend's farm up in Brisbane and her family um, grows uh, – the Asian produce, such as eggplant, uh, eggplants and okra, cucumber, and oh god, I can't remember now. But I went there and I saw the farm, and I, you know, it was absolutely beautiful. But I realized because I picked some of the eggplants, like the 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 long eggplants. I don't know what you call yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, they're long eggplants and the Lebanese okra. eggplants. Yes, that's right. So we picked yeah. them and we had had lunch. And I thought, you know what? We actually, when we go to the super, uh, to not the supermarket, but when you go to the grocery stores, when I shop in Cabramatta, and you go to those uh, uh, groceries and you see all of the vegetables there, the bok choy, the coriander, the Lebanese, um, the uh, eggplants and the okra, and you think, you, you used to buy them and not, or I, I used to buy them, and the majority of people used to buy them, as you said, but don't think about them. So now when I um, buy them, I know that um that they have it comes from a vine yeah it comes from a vine <laughs> but that they, her family has to box them and then take them to uh, truck them down to Flemington or something like that mm-hmm. and from Flemington then they have to um you know the co- it, it's hard work it's hard yeah. work how much it is it is for farmers to sell those boxes of uh, fruit and veggies um and how much money and and it also based on the fluctuation of the dollar as well and all of that mm-hmm. and but you know it's how can you really educate consumers that that the hard work behind it though you know because a, a lot of people just go to the markets and go and buy and then go home and cook yeah so i think um everything starts with having a personal connection um and um you know i i think that uh enthusiasm is infectious um and i hope that that rubs on to yourself and and many other people but you know um you know, when, when people go to shop, when I go into a market, I get so excited because I'm looking for stuff that, you know, I'm looking for something special and I'm looking for something that's not just looking good but tasting really good. And, you know, I'll use my senses like my smell and, um, you know, not just my eyes but my touch as well. And, you know, for instance, a cucumber, right? Most people will look at a cucumber and think it's just a cucumber, not myself. I think about how the cucumber has come from the vine, and if it's sharper at the bottom, it'll be a bit more crispy, so it'll have less water in it, and and that's what I want. I want that crispy texture in a cucumber. I don't want all those watery seeds in the middle. So I'm thinking about all these things as I'm going to to, to shop for cucumbers, and this is just one piece of produce. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's about that personal connection. So as you mentioned, you stepped on the farm and you realised that, wow, there's so much involved. And whenever you buy okra now, you'll, you'll think about that time when you're at the farm and you saw it on the vine. I think and of Nina's some... farm. I think of Nina's farm and the okra. Right, yeah, <laughs> Nina's farm. And you, you saw the curly ones yeah. and the long ones yeah, and the yeah. short ones. So I think it's it's not just about stepping on the farm, but it is going to the Flemington markets and it is talking to fruiters. You know, um, the supermarkets have commoditized fruit and veg so that everything needs to sell itself on the shelf, right? Yeah. But if you go to those markets like Paddy's Markets or Flemington Markets or, um, you know, um, the markets where the fruiter has actually talked to you and they might actually even cut a piece of fruit for you mm. and give you a bit of a conversation. I want 
a little bit of that back into society. I, I want a bit of that personal connection where, you know, the somebody is telling you that peaches are in season or mangoes are in season. And it's not just in season, but this week these mangoes are brilliant because I went to the market and I realized that these mangoes aren't just watery when you cut it, just water just juices out, but it's actually got really good sour tang and flavor to it. It's not stringy. You know, I hate when all those stringy fibers get yeah, stuck yeah. in your teeth, right? When I talk about it, it gets me excited and I hope that it gets yeah, other people excited. But salivate, but I want to I'm have salivating. I'm salivating. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we're going to get people more excited and engaged in fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Tell me, ha- has it been a challenging journey or have there been any hurdles along that journey of yours trying to obviously create this new um, concept about the importance of fruit and vegetables and getting people to excited about it has it been a uh you know have there been hurdles along the way oh plenty you know plenty of setbacks i i um you know i wrote a script for a tv show and um you know it was very close to being commissioned there was a few production companies that picked it up but we weren't able to get funding for it and i'm still looking for funding but um, i'm never going to give up um but yeah no plenty of setbacks and um you know, for me, uh, you learn from your setbacks and your mistakes and you grow from them. You know, since since I wasn't able to get my shop, um, I started doing my master's in food systems and gastronomy. And that was to give myself a very holistic view of fruit and vegetables, but also not just fruit and vegetables, but of other industries like meat, dairy, um, seafood, so that I could understand how these industries work and how potentially fruit and veg could grow. Um, you know, uh, I'm still on this journey and, and uh, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get this shot, but, you know, even if I just am able to convince one person to be a fruiterer or to get into the industry and become a horticulturalist or, you know, um, want to be more engaged or cook food in a different way or look at food in a different way, I'm sure that there were plenty of those people before me that inspired me, like, you know, the hoodies or con the, the, con the fruiterers. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right, con the fruiterer. You know, it, it just having that hero, having that spokesperson for the industry, you know, I, I know that I'm not going to be able to influence and inspire everyone, but if I'm able to inspire one person, then the journey is worth it. Now, I know that in terms of a hurdle, a major hurdle for you is on the plate of origin show, whereby uh, cooking Vietnamese dishes and uh, by the name of the program, plate of origin, it meant that Vietnam was the origin of your dishes. Uh, but one of the controversial issues around that was the use of the flag to promote mm. the show. And that has been a hurdle for you, a major hurdle. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, it's, it, uh, the flag has been a very sensitive issue for um, some Vietnamese Australians. And, and I understand their points of view. And um, free speech is one of the cornerstones of democracy and the values that we live by. So I'm more than, you know, happy for them to, you know, voice their opinions. For, for me as a second generation Vietnamese Australian, um, you know, I, I haven't seen some of the atrocities that have happened in the world, so I can't comment. You know, the, uh, people like my parents and your parents and yourself have gone through far more than myself. Um, what I do want to say is that I hope that, you know, regardless of um, the position that um, some Austra- Vietnamese Australians see themselves in, I hope that the next generation of Vietnamese Australians um, are open to their brothers and sisters in Vietnam and don't see the atrocities of the past as something that holds them back from reconnecting with the Vietnam of today. Um, and I hope that, you know, um, we can live as as one, not just Vietnam, but one, uh, you know, global citizen where, you know, a flag doesn't separate us. And that's what uh, I guess um, disappoints me the most, that um, something symbolic as a flag would separate Vietnamese people. But I understand the reasons why it has done so. Um, uh, I mean, it's war. People, people, Mm. um, you know, people have passed away and... um, yeah, it's yeah. a very sad, sad moment in, in, in our history. But, you know, I hope that the next generation um, can move forward from this. And when that happened, did you have discussions with your family, with your mum and your dad or people, you know, like that came or, or left Vietnam at the end of the war? Did you kind of explore a bit further to see um, in terms of their angst and their 
anxieties around that? Like, did, did you dig, dig deeper? Yeah, you know, like I've, I've uh, my parents have only spoken about it briefly throughout my life. Um, Cause they, it's, they, they, they arri- did you know, they escape I, or did they arrive here? Um, what, what, what was their journey like? Yeah, so they um, they left Rakya um, in '76 and then were uh, boat people. My dad was actually the captain of the boat because he was a fisherman with 176 people on the boat, and uh, they sailed for three days to get to Malaysia, the island of Bidong. Yes, and they were there for nearly just over 18 months. So you know, and and they they obviously had not so great memories of Bidong with um, you know the the kind of living conditions. Um, of of that that time so you know i i definitely feel for my sister who was only you know six months at the time just born um and uh you know to your question regarding you know did i speak to people of the past about these moments um it's not something they want to delve upon you know they they want to i don't know if it's just my parents or some vietnamese um migrants but they wanted to move on from it they realize how blessed they are to be here in australia and I know that for some people it's taken a while to get over, but now my parents go back to Vietnam and they enjoy the gentrification of Vietnam um, and, and are able to go back and just just enjoy it for what it's become and then come back here in Australia because they know <laughs> that Australia is such a blessed country to be in. But, um, yeah, you know, it's a funny one because um, my ancestry comes from China and um, from Guangzhou and from Guangdong, sorry, and... Uh, the communists pushed my grandparents out of China and then I guess the communists pushed my parents out of Vietnam. Oh. So theoretically, if history repeats itself, the communists will push me out of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> um, hopefully not. <laughs> no, it won't happen. Not hopefully. No, it won't happen. Um, so, the, so for you, did you... Um, struggle with it uh, at all in terms of you know were you attacked for being on the show and having that flag that's you know for the group of Vietnamese like your parents like my parents who escaped um, when the flag was the yellow and three stripes flag uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, you know how you know how did you come to terms with that yeah, look, it's always really harsh receiving some kind of negative feedback online. And, um, you know, I definitely read it and took it to heart. Um, but, you know, I just didn't want to engage in a conversation on social media. I, I think that um, there's so much yelling happening on social media um, that, you know, I just wanted to avoid the situation because I was happy for them to comment and post and have their voice um, and for others to read it because, you know, certainly the other contestants were like, is this um, is this a, a, a hoax or, you know, what, what's this about? And I had to explain it to the other contestants that, you know, this isn't, um, this is something sensitive to Vietnamese Australians. And, and I was really happy to educate them about the situation and my thoughts on it, um, trying to be as neutral as possible. Um, but, yeah, look, I just didn't want to engage in a, in a conversation online. I, I, I feel as though, um, you know, there's, it's, it's hard to get the message through. Um, but, you know, if I ever saw the person face to face, I definitely have the conversation with them and would, would listen to them, you know, and, and, um, you know, I wouldn't try to influence them in any way because uh, I think that would be wrong of me. They've had this personal connection to, you know, the flags and whatnot. But, um, you know, my hope really is for the next generation to, to be one people. So, um, yeah, that's my hope. Well, that's, that's my hope too. Uh, some sort of reconciliation and, and uh, as you said, and I think we've spoken about reconciliation. this. Reconciliation. Uh, we've spoken about this ton is that um, we've, you know, I, I definitely have uh, seen, you know, am the product of the war. My my family and your family have escaped, um, you know, Vietnam at the end of the war, you know, being chased out by communists. Uh, so we, we understand, for me, I do t- definitely understand that. Um, it's about how do, as you said, you know, we are Vietnamese. You know, for me, I, I'm, I was born in Vietnam, Saigon, and I would love to see some kind of reconciliation reconciliation one day whereby how can we put to bed um, and acknowledge the atrocities that have uh, been um, co- that have uh, been caused and uh, and the wars and the the, 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 the sorrow of wars there's, there's a book called the sorrow there's a great book called the sorrows of mm. war and it's a great book um, 
and is that it, it impacts everybody. It's not just one side or another. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, so let's, let's see if you yeah, and I can create that connection. The Sorrows of War is, uh, is a great line. Um, just last year, I was in Berlin and um, I was at a memorial oh, um, yes, in I was. Berlin. Yes, I've been. Um, um, actually, where, where just where Hitler was, was suicided, actually. Yeah. And um, it was so solemn. And, uh, and it was hard to see the light knowing what had happened there. And, um, you know, I, I really feel for, you know, not just the, the, the Jewish people, but, but so many people and, and, um, yeah, you know, f forgiveness or, uh, I don't think forgetfulness is, is a word that we should use, but, uh, forgiveness is something really difficult. Um, especially when, you know, lives are lost and families lost. Um, but I think time is something that, you know, is really important to just uh, cross the bridge. And, and um, I wouldn't, I, I don't think, I don't even know if healing is the word, but I think reconciliation, acceptance and, and, and moving on and, and hoping that we learn the lessons from history so these things don't happen again is really important. Absolutely. I, I think, um, I think it's about uh, reconciliation and, and about, like I said, em embracing um, acknowledging not and not acknowledging it has happened acknowledging and yeah. and therefore how do we then create a future that we can all step into um, that will bring you know the Vietnamese um, people together around the world um, that's that's my one also my one dream um, so you know we can both work on that ton <laughs> yes we can and you know you mentioned a really good point about you know learning from from history and, and accepting and acknowledging you know, and 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 that's bringing this back to fruit and veg. Yes. Um, I want, I really want, um, you know, our next generation to learn about um, the fruit and veg industry, food, not just fruit and veg, but food and how food has developed over time so that they can understand why we're in the food system we are in today and how if they want to eat better, they can. And, and what is eating better? And who has the right to say what is good and not? Um, those are really challenging questions that we have and that we face um, in the food industry. Now, along this journey, you surely would have had um, some mentors, um, coaches. Um, did you look and do you, did, did you search out for them actively? Did you actively search out for them? Yeah, look, I've had, I've, I've got plenty of mentors um, and they, they all come from many walks in life. And I think that's one thing that, um, you know, probably been a, uh, a core part of my success, um, you know, if you could call it success or my journey is that I've had plenty of mentors and I don't even know if I would call them mentors, but just, you know, friends, people who I would consider my friends that have, um, given me advice and, 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 um, you know, harsh criticism or even just their point of view, because, uh, we all have different points of view and understanding where they've come from and how they want to, they believe that I should move forward. Um, whether that's through my school, I've had, I've got a few mentors from school and, and some from uni and then many in the industry, in the fruit and vegetable industry, some with, you know, huge multi-million dollar avocado farms and others that are, you know, um, you know, just small lychee growers. They all have um, their roles to play in. Um, you know, some of them are from overseas and, you know, they do business so differently overseas. You know, Australia is such a transparent country to live mm. and operate in. Whilst, you know, when you work in places like Indonesia or, you know, Vietnam or China, there's so much politics that happens and so much cultural differences in gifting and, yep. you know, um, going to dinners and all these things that are, um, you know, very critical in, in terms of the way that you operate. So, you know, having all those cultural um, mentors to, to give me a better understanding of the world, um, uh, that's really helped me. And, and I would give that advice to anybody in any industry. The more mentors you have in and in, outside of your industry, the better that better place, better place that you will be to, to hopefully succeed and, and, and grow. Mm. Now, were there any dark moments along that journey of, you know, uh, I don't know, chasing your dream or, or, or aspiring to those goals that you've set? Were there any moments where you think, oh, my God, this is so challenging, you know, fruit and veggies, really, you know, people aren't listening. <laughs> <laughs> They're just eating it oh. without thinking. <laughs> A hundred percent die, hundred percent. You know, there's, uh, I, I think for a year, I can't remember, um, I think it was 2018. I, 
I, I'd been on the chef's line, which was on SBS. And that was, um, that was amazing because that was kind of the stepping stone for me to realize that, um, that I potentially could have a seat at the table and, and, and that, um, you know, I was moving in the right direction. And then, um, you know, the show was, uh, the, the show that I'd written was, was getting some, um, spotlight, but then I, I failed to get funding and then I was given my script back and then I didn't know what to do. You know, like I was kind of like, Oh, where to now? And, uh, and I must say, I probably wasted half of an entire year just kind of, you know, um, and I, I shouldn't say waste. It was just because I have such high expectations of myself. I, I always want to be moving on to the next thing or progressing in the right direction. And um, and actually, it took one of my best friends to get me out of it. He, you were in a um, slump. We had a chat you were in one a day. Slump? You were in a slump for about six months. Is that what I was in saying? a slump, and and he's a video producer. Uh-huh. Um, and he said to me, um, I don't even, I can't even remember how it got to this, but he was. I was kind of in a rut and he said, look, um, you know, if you want, oh, let, let's, do a, let's do a video of what you want to do. And I did a video about how apples are one year old and that was my pilot episode. So I'd got this um, story which I wanted to produce and it wasn't produced. So I decided to create my own first episode, um, which would have cost me over ten, fifteen thousand dollars to to produce. But uh, my friend was really kind enough to, to help me produce that. And when I did produce it, I realized a lot about myself, a lot about me as, as a talent and how I present on screen and, and also about, um, you know, initially this pilot was all about education. So, you know, I went to the CSIRO, I did all the scientific stuff about health and I went to the farm, I spoke to the apple farmer and, you know, the person that stores the apples for a year and it was all about education. Yep. But what I'd realized over time was that it's hard to keep an audience engaged for 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we live in a very fast, fast. paced, sub 30 yeah. second content yeah. uh, society now. And so um, I've started to change the way that I produce content to be more engaging. So it's all about engaging the audience now. And I think if I can engage and enthuse people, it'll be enough for them to spark their interest and then get that education involved. So, you know, that really got me going again. It got me cooking again. It got me writing again. And then, of course, I started doing my master's and that's really um, developed my food voice, um, uh, which is what uh, I guess journalists or food journalists consider um, uh, your uh, your personality in, in the industry. Yep, your brand. That was your brand. You develop, develop your brand. That's it, the fruit nerd. <laughs> <laughs> the fruit nerd. Uh, well, you know, so look, obviously you then went on to um, Planet of Origin. Plate, a planet, I call it Planet of Origin. Plate of Origin. <laughs> I call it Planet of Origin. Plate of Origin. How did you get onto that? Um, that was a, you know, what a what an interesting story that is. Um a good friend of mine uh, is a great Vietnamese cook and um, uh, his wife actually really wanted uh, him to go on to the show. And so <laughs> we applied together. His name's Alex. Um, and, uh, and we were able to get onto the show and Seven accepted us. Um, but Alex wasn't able to commit to the schedule, which at the time was a commitment of four months away from work. And that's almost like halting your career. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he'd worked really hard for, you know, many years to build up clientele as a dentist and, um, and, uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to get onto the show or, uh, I guess, um, commit to the show, but, um, I'm really lucky that Duncan, I asked Duncan and, uh, he was able to commit and he's got a really strong foodie dream and, you know, um, he's an excellent cook, um, you know. Um, in many ways, a better cook than myself in terms of being reactionary in the kitchen and being able to fix things on the spot. I'm so planted. I'm like, yeah. every minute of the cook is all planned. <laughs> but when things go wrong, I'm like, ah! <laughs> Turn to so, um, yeah, look, that's how we got into the show. And um, and um, we both have, you know, very um, competitive drives, but also we, we also are really proud of our Vietnamese heritage. So we really wanted to showcase um, Vietnamese food in different ways and we were able to work on our strengths together to become a really good team. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Mm, so where to now for you, now that it's, uh, you know, the plate of origin is over and obviously you're focusing on your masters as well. 
So where to next for Tan Chung, aka Fruit Nerd? Yeah, look, um, you know, I'm. I must say, I'm not sure exactly what is next, but I want to work towards the right direction. And for me, I want to be an authority of fruit and vegetables um, here in Australia and potentially in the world. You know, there's not many. There's many chefs that you would consider, you know, idols, whether they are, you know, champions of meat or seafood or um, you know, plant-based options, but you don't see any fruiterers out there. There are no fruiterers where people are like, oh, you know, if I want to learn more about fruit and veg or herbs, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll follow that um, fruiterer. And, and that's what I want to be. I want to be somebody that really engages and enthuses people and someone, not that people look up to, but, but uh, can, can um, go to when they uh, need that knowledge or have those questions. And, um, you know, I'd love to get a, a have a show that, that, um, highlights that, whether that's the, you know, food hacks or fruit hacks or um, the cultural implications of how food is, fruit, fruit and veg are eaten in different ways in different cultures. Like in Japan, it's a gift and, you know, it's giving people wealth. And in, you know, Vietnamese tradition, we use it, you know, many very much as a, you know, a dessert at the end of a meal. And, and, right. and it's certainly seen in a different light from Western culture. But, um, you know, there's certainly um, many great aspects of fruit and veg in Western culture too, which is, you know, how it's so readily available to so many people at such a low cost. And, and that's also been a feat of mankind. So I want to tell these stories to everybody um, and uh, be an authority in fruit and veg. So, you know, as long as I'm going in that direction, I'm happy. And as long as, you know, I'm, you know, one person is interested in my content, then, um, you know, I'm super happy. Let's see if we can make that happen. <laughs> thanks, Guy. Let's, let's, and thanks let's, for giving me let's this put opportunity it out there. to be on this podcast. Oh, no, it's great. It's Look, I think it's uh, that's our purpose, um, you know, to exist, is to actually ensuring that stories like this gets um, more a, a platform and, uh, and push, push these kind of stories so, so that the wider audience, the wider community in Australia – can actually learn learn from you know the talent the amazing talent that we have here that makes up Australia. Um, last but not least, tell us about your uh, what 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 would you like people to remember for you for other than your fruit shirt? I would love people just to remember me as somebody who is really passionate and somebody who would never give up on their hope and dreams of you know really pushing the fruit and vegetable agenda. Um, in both the positive and the negative, just telling it how it is. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, we live in a society that is very, very difficult to manoeuvre now with social media and so many of the different um, aspects of how the world has changed. But, um, you know, going back to our roots, going back to food, going back to fruit and vegetables is something that we can all relate to and that we should all think about more often when we eat conscious eating because good food starts with good produce thank you and anything about the fruit shirt how are you going to throw the fruit shirt in how? well mangosteen <laughs> mangosteen, yeah, so that's mangosteen right. is my favorite fruit because it is the perfect balance of sourness and sweetness but there's a lot of fruit that's sour and sweet like mangoes but with mangosteen it is so moorish i could just eat kilos and kilos and not stop and from an Eastern point of view, it's quite a cooling piece of fruit. So ah. eating a lot of it will cool your body down. Ah, very expensive at the moment in Australia if you buy them. <laughs> so uh, you can eat them by the kilos in Vietnam, but here, by God, it's expensive. That's all I know. That's <laughs> This is true. We've got to change that. <laughs> yeah, we have to change. You can change that. So thank you so much for your time, um, Tan. And, uh, you know, we wish you... Great success in your uh, endeavour and I will do what we can at Dawn Cast here to ensure that we get some kind of fruit uh, fruit nerd show on, on our, our uh, you know, our other channels and, and getting to, down to the nitty gritty of fruit and vegetables. Thanks, Di. But, you know, I'm so blessed to have this opportunity to chat to you and that I hope that everybody who's listening, you know, thinks about fruit and veg in a different way and that, you know, by listening to this podcast, they just get a little bit more excited about fruit and vegetables and just go back into their fruit store and be like, 
hey, that cucumber, let me just give it a feel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will now definitely look out for that cucumber. So that's it. I'm Dai Lee and you've been listening to watching Dawncast Vodcast with Tan Chung, a.k.a. Mr. Fruit Nerd. And thank you very much for his time. And if you would like to hear more stories like this, please click on the bell button below and subscribe uh, to our channel and hopefully we'll hear more stories like this. So see you next time. Bye. You better See ya. turn up You better be there when I shake Watch me rockin' if I can't stop